Brother Fuller, we love you. Whatsoever the Lord saith unto you, tell us. The gate is open, treasures old and new. Let's worship God and magnify the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. That's it. Let's magnify the Lord. Let's exalt his name together. Let's do it in harmony, a symphony together. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Do your work tonight, Lord. For the sovereign word of the Spirit speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. In the still quiet of dawn, March 13th, 1933, an apparent vigorous redwood suddenly toppled to its death, crumbling with a shattering clamor in a California forest. It ended 12 centuries of life, which was but an adolescent for a redwood who, among its species, easily lives four to five millenniums or more. Sections of the tree were preserved, and science, through the art and craft of tree ring chronology, opened a graphic autobiography of the tree's past. Somewhere during the Dark Ages, it saw the rendering rent of an earthquake and how the tree fought the effects of that awesome wound. Sometime during the Renaissance, a fungus attacked the tree, and the tree for a long period of time fought the effects of the fungus. Sometime during the Pilgrims, the colonization of the eastern seaboard. Lightning struck the tree, but again it fought off the effects of the wound. The rings revealed growth trends within the tree. In one period of growth, the tree suffered through what must have been times of drought, times of storm and stress. For in one century of growth, it achieved but a mere eight inches of growth and its girth and yet at another time it achieved 36 inches of growth in another century. There were times of great store, stress and storm written in the past history of the tree and there were also centuries where there were no crisis or problems. But in 1810 a careless Indian campfire burned a 13 foot scar on the northern side of the tree kind of inconsequential and insignificant really when you're looking at a tree that stands 320 feet tall that weighed over 500 tons but the supporting roots on the north side of the tree were heavily damaged for more than 120 years the graphic story was told within the rings of how the tree fought the effects of the wound but it was a wound that never healed. So on the quiet spring dawn 62 years ago, it wasn't much. The conjecture of the foresters was that perhaps the weight of a small bird visiting a southern limb at the top of the tree was enough to tilt it and start it down. Or perhaps it was the warming sun of the dawn that caused the molecules of the air to expand and that gentle breeze that always happens at sunrise was enough to tug on it and bring it to its death. Organizations and churches and individuals have demarcations in their soul just like the tree has rings. It tells periods of spiritual growth. It demarks stagnation and dark days and wounds. If you will read, if you're a careful student of history, you will note that most nations and institutions and even great men in the apparent full vigor of life, when they fell, it was during a minor adversity. Because the soul revealed a long unhealed wound and slowly they were destroyed from the inside. 
Organization in churches that dwarf others, like the Redwood Dwarfs, its species. Ministries that tower above, as in the parable of Jephthah, when the trees came to anoint a king. But all of the mighty can be felled if there is inflicted a wound that never heals. Jesus offered the description of the fall of the soul, and he said it fell, and great was the fall of it. Uzziah was but a teen, 13 years old, when he ascended to the throne of Israel. Isaiah's hero reigned for 52 years. Most of that reign, the Bible said he did that which was right in the sight of God. But time passed. Uzziah became careless. And Uzziah became presumptuous. He'd been around a long time. Hear me tonight, ministry of the United Pentecostal Church and ministries of the apostolic faith. All of us must stand the test of time. If there has been an enemy in the field that has sowed his tares, inevitably in the process of time, the evidence will be revealed all too readily that an enemy has been in the field. The Bible said that he went into the holy place and offered incense on the altar of God. We all know that these are sacred precincts of the priest, but I'm not altogether sure that it was the act because another king before him went into the holy place and partook of the shoe bread. I'm not sure whether it was the act or the attitude of the man, but regardless, in the folly of the act or the attitude, the Lord smote him with leprosy. It was a small spot that started on his forehead and began to gather momentum. Because he was a king, his prerogative and his uh, prerogatives of state, he was not banished to a colony of lepers. There was built for him a house just beyond the palace. The Bible said he dwelt the rest of his days in a separated house. But the crisis of the story is this, that Uzziah had a son by the name of Jotham. One day in the interlude of father to son, passing on the needed things as the Kilgore was doing to us today, one generation passing on concepts that root us back to the generation that preceded us. And in those contexts of conversation, Uzziah was preparing Jotham for leadership and that day Jotham ventured across that unspoken boundary and he inquired about the spot. Dad, you're a king. Where in the world did you come into contact with leprosy? Dad, where did, where did you, where, where were you ever exposed to something so hideous and so damning? Uzziah dropped his head and he said, Son, I got this in the temple. In the temple, Dad. Tell me that happened anywhere but the temple. Tell me that happened anywhere but in the precincts of God. I don't know whether Jotham ever understood the carelessness or the presumptuousness of his father or not. But this I know. As a young man, a wound was inflicted that never healed. And the Bible said that he never entered the temple all the days of his life. Because when he was young, a wound was inflicted. And the Bible said that he taught the people of God to do wickedly. Sixteen years ago, I was called to the bedside of a man who had been a formal offic former official for a long time in this organization. I did not know him well, but something in him gravitated or he drew out from me. I went to his bedside. He explained that he did not have long to live. There was a son and a grandson that he was particularly disturbed about. And he wanted some assurance from me that as long as I live, that I would do what I could to save his son and his grandson. I explained that I didn't know his son, so he called and his son drove up from Atlanta down to where he was. As his son stood by the bedside, I watched as that old patriot reached out to his boy and tried to gather him close to the Spirit of God. 
He begged him that day at the bedside. He said, son, will you, will you lift your hands and pray with me? I, I don't have long left to live. Would you just, please, for dad, would you reach out to God from, with me? And I watched as the old man with tears streaming down his face reached out toward God. But I saw the hardened boy as he stood with hard, rigid arms folded across him. I saw him with the glare of bitterness in his face as he stood there. He would not in any sense acknowledge God. What happened was that somewhere in that man's past, the old man's past, he bore a wound that sometimes happens to ministers. But when that wound that never healed, the bitterness was passed on to his son. And to this day, that boy is cold and impervious to any touch of the Spirit. Brethren, we're in the ministry and we must expect damage. As trees catch the wind and tussle with the storm, we must expect that our lives are going to be windblown and storm torn and damaged. We must expect it in the calling. We're going to attract lightning. We're going to be exposed to storm. We're going to be exposed to test. As any good shepherd in the protection of his sheep, we will fight bears and lions that they will never know anything about to protect them and will bear hidden scars of a shepherd that just goes with the occupation. And Jesus warned us in the ministry that we had to be careful for the proclivities of things that go with the ministry because he said to his disciples, woe unto you when offense comes of all the perils and plagues of revelation, of the vials and the trumpets and the seals. None of them are so damning. None of them are so devastating as the woes. And so he used in that frame of reference that when offense comes, it is as if a woe has come. And it's the time to be especially vigilant and concerned. But the soul will vividly reveal those battles that you have had in your past ministry. But what it'll also show is how you handled it. And how long it took you to heal from the afflicted wound that came. They say in a tree that where there has been damage and stress in the storm, that when the fibers of the wood heal, that a strength appears that was not there before. So it is in the soul. But where the weakness remains, it carries it through ring after ring after ring. It carries it deep into the heart of the tree maybe even like the redwood for 120 years. Could I ask you tonight what's your story? Everybody has one. Everyone can tell a tale of inflicted wounds of injustice somewhere in the past. But the difference between all of us is not what happened, but how we healed and were affected by what did happen. There is no wound that you can have inflicted that can ever bring failure to your ministry. There is not a wound that can ever happen to you at the hands of anyone that can steal your voice, that can silent or neutralize your ministry. The only thing that can do that is your attitude and your response to the wounds that come to your life. Offense can become significant instruments of God if you just won't become cynical and bitter. It seems to me, I just seem to feel that God's wisdom is best taught and mediated in the processes of tragedy. I know that my greatest growth in my life came at a time when I wandered in the rubble of a broken dream that was shattered by uncaring tongues and hands. But in that 
time of process of fighting with bitterness and begging God to either take it, relieve it, or kill me, that the greatest spiritual progress and growth in my life occurred. I know this at the depth of character that I lacked in some areas. God mediated to me through the process of the developing warfare of seeking to make a correct response in the face of justice, injustice. I know that probably the greatest strengths that I bring to the pulpit of the church I pastor have grown out of the wounds of the past. There are people sitting here tonight, there are preachers and preachers' wives who have suffered or are suffering through circumstances of injustice that you cannot change. Can I tell you tonight that the Lord spoke to me in the hotel, but the man had confirmed it in his office, that if somebody will hear this message tonight, and if the bitterness can pour out of your heart, there is a family member, a wife, yourself or child, that God will raise up from a crippling infirmity and set you free. The tormentors of bitterness have you bound and fettered. You may not be able to change your circumstance, but you certainly have the power to control and change your response. Our injustices don't always happen to us when we're wrong. Oft times they come to us when we're doing that which was right. It was in the process of gathering the sticks and encouraging the fire to warm and to dry out the cold and chilled. Members of the shipwreck, when a viper come up out of the fire and latched itself under the hand of Paul. And the Bible said that he just shook it off in the fire and that he walked on. The best response that you can make to bitterness, the best response you can make to injustice is to shake it off in the fire revival and just go on living for God. But if you can't shake it off, there's some place that you can go. For he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was put upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Calvary is still the answer. Oh, hallelujah. David was residing in Hebron. Among his wives was the daughter of the king of Geshur. She bore unto him two children by the name of Absalom and Tamar. At the time of the story, Absalom was 21 and Tamar was 18. They were beautiful, stately, elegant children. Another of David's wives was a Ahinoam, who was a Jezreelitess, and she bore him one son by the name of Amnon. With cunning counsel of a friend, the Bible said that they by subterfuge plotted the rape of Tamar. The day that she was violated, Tamar's life was devastated. She was never given in marriage. She never was allowed to be a keeper of the home. She never cradled children in the caring arms as a mother and nurtured them. When Absalom heard her story, the unparalleled faith, unquestioned faith in his father knew that he would require of Amnon a full recompense for his heinous act. But months passed and nothing was done. He watched as the ravages of humiliation ate the soul and the spirit and the heart, the beauty right out of the countenance of his sister. In a seething crucible in his heart, he brewed a bitterness that plotted a fateful day of retribution. When the day came, he tasted the sweet blood of vengeance for him and his sister. He fled to Geshur to hide in the shadow of his grandfather's throne, but the wound didn't heal. Somehow the blood of Amnon, the vengeance, did not satiate the appetite of bitterness. It festered, and it festered, and it festered. 
Joab sought to bring about a reconciliation. And so he employed the wise woman of Tekoa. And her carefully crafted story turned the heart of David. And the king beckoned and Absalom was returned to Jerusalem. But he was not reconciled to his father. In fact, the Bible said, and it's a message all its own, it says that Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. Sister Mangan, it's exactly what you were preaching about today. Men that live in the ministry who preach but never one time in the week ever go someplace and find God and look into the king's face. You come and go from the church. You come and go from the ministry. You come and go from the office. But it's been so long since you've seen the king's face. Seven years separated Absalom from the injustice. Now, after his two years of unreconciled differences with his father back in Jerusalem, seven years. Let me bring this sad saga to a quick conclusion. The aftermath of this story, Brother Anthony Mangan, is that 40,000 innocent men died in the wake of Absalom's bitterness. Caught up in his battle, 40,000 young men were swept into Absalom's bitterness and died on the battlefield with him. Brother Kilgore, how many young men today are being damaged by bitterness and wounds that have long since passed, that should have long since been to Calvary how many of our kids are further going to be lost how many more churches are going to be devastated how many more districts are going to be prisoners of stagnation and sterility because we constantly are bending down to the corpses of dead issues and dead wounds and constantly trying to breathe and resuscitate new life into them. We can talk about revival all we want to. We can preach about power and faith and prayer all we want to. But until our hearts are knit together as one, until our souls are knit together by one spirit, we are just talking. We'll never see the majesty of promised revival. Clap your hands to the Lord. Please be seated. I can hear it. Oh, I'm far too smart for that, Brother Fuller. I'm far too wise to fall in that, that trap. Well, I'm thankful that you are. I, I know that I'm not. The Bible said that Ahithophel, who was in the family of Uriah, had had a seething bitterness that brewed in his soul because of the unresolved mitre of Uriah. David was not permitted to build the temple, not because he was a man of war. It had nothing to do with the blood of Philistines and Canaanites on his hands. It was the blood of Uriah that was on his hands that God forbid him to build that house. And that bitterness seethed in the soul of Ahithophel. And when David heard that Ahithophel had went and joined Absalom, the Bible said David feared the counsel of Ahithophel more than all the valiant men in the armies of Absalom. And so he sent counsel to disrupt. And the bitterness brewed in the soul of Ahithophel. And the Bible says that when Absalom did not enjoin his counsel, that Ahithophel went and set his house in order and hanged himself. Don't sit there with bitterness in your heart. Don't sit there one more service with a spirit of injustice brewing the acid of a wound in your soul because he was wounded for your transgression. He was bruised for your iniquity. The chastisement of his, our peace was upon him. With stripes we are healed. When the disciples of John the Baptist heard that the beloved Baptist head had been given to Salome and Her Herodias on the silver challenger. The Bible said his disciples went and told Jesus. 
When tragedy strikes and hurt and pain comes, Brother Kilgore, there's no better place than you can go to tell than just go tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my sorrows. He said, I will help you in six troubles, yea, in seven. Suddenly a man falls. The leaves are still green. The bark and the root of his ministry look so very healthy. But inside there's a hollow shell because something's been eating that heart out for a long, long time. The Bible says the righteous shall flourish as the palm. The palm is different than all other trees in the forest. Every other tree has its life just beneath the bark at the surface. That's why when it gir you girdle it, it easily dies. It's why the little foxes spoil the vine because in trying to get to the grapes, their paws carve out and girdle the vine and kill it. But a palm is different. Its life is not at the surface, it's at the center. You can hack it, you can girdle it. The storm and the wind can bend it over, but it'll stand right back up because the life is in a place where the storm can't touch it. I want to put my Holy Ghost, I want to put my ministry someplace in the center of Him where all of hell and all of life cannot touch that which He's given. The wound is a wound, and Calvary cannot be bypassed. Some of you sustained some damage in 1994, and you're here tonight, and you're hurting, and you know that in all the Spirit of God you felt, that nagging thing keeps nagging at your heart and tugging at your spirit. Like, like Haman, you say, everything in my life is wonderful except, except the matter of Mordecai except that one issue everything in your life and ministry is wonderful except that one person who brought the injustice that one person who brought the wound yes brother Tenney you better deal with it yes you better deal with it because if you don't just like the redwood tree it'll slowly in time eat your soul out it'll eat the heart out of your church it'll eat the heart out of a district it'll eat the heart out of an entire organization and we can fall just like the redwood before our prime before we reach the full maturation the revival that God intends for us to have I've seen a lot of storms come through Atlanta. We are in a place in a tropical zone, subtropical that is just indigenous to spawning off huge hurricanes and mighty storms. I've watched the winds come through and take mighty oaks and rock them and move them. I've watched the oaks as they struggle with their branches, wrestling and fighting and tussling with the wind. I've seen the wind snap off branches of trees as huge and round as this pulpit just twisted off. I've seen it almost strip a tree of its leaves. When the storm is over, you can come back with a chainsaw and dress up the tree and rake up the limbs. And after a year or two, the tree will have healed from the storm. And it'll be back in all of its profusion. And you'll see the squirrels and the birds visiting again. And life goes on because the tree healed. But in that same storm, another tree standing not far from it, perhaps larger, fell in the storm. You can't just rake up its leaves. You just can't pick it up and stand it back up. I've watched storms come through my church with the Kilgore. I've watched the twisting winds of adversity. I have seen saints as they have tussled and struggled and fought with spirits and things. And yes, they suffered some damage. There was some limbs broken and some leaves stripped away. But as a pastor, it was easy to dress them up, rake up the leaves and put the healing balm back on them. And they just go on. But in the, in the same storm, I've watched other saints fall. The only thing you can do is just cut them up. So many cords, stack them over here. It's just fire material because 
somewhere deep inside of the tree that looked healthy. Invariably, the saw will find it, that place where the rot goes all the way to the center, and it ate the heart out of that tree. I'm going to tell you your circumstances do not dictate who you are or what you are. They only reveal who you are and what you are. Life's tragic occasions cannot make you bitter or better. They can only reveal what you are. Because the fire that melts the wax will also harden clay. But it will only purify gold all the same fire but what happens is what the material that the fire touches if in your heart and spirit there is the motive of pure gold about spiritual concepts all that adversity can do is tug and pull all it can do is make scissors and weaknesses that God can heal and make you strong in those weaknesses but if you're clay your spirit will become harder and harder and harder but if you are not even of the spiritual constitution of dirt the fire will melt you and dissipate you as wax Potiphar's chains could only wound the wrist and the ankles of Joseph Joseph refused to allow the wounds and scars to touch his soul she was attractive she was bright almost with touches of brilliance charming with a subtle understated eloquence she was a caring person caring enough that a gregarious magnetism drew friends to her she genuinely cared her passion was her horse the accident that day was freakish yet tragic it left her paralyzed she blamed God she became sullen and harsh and angry and abusive slowly in self-defense her friends began to withdraw from her and even some of the family as her bitterness grew it seemed that every day somehow she had to weave in a conversation she had to vomit out the poison and vent the venom of the injustice of the tragedy finally one came who looked past all the bitterness and then said I want to tell you a story of the legend of the canyons it seems that the master one day was walking over the prairies enjoying the warmth of the sun basking in the smile of all the flowers that he had planted at creation but he noticed that those that he had planted that he loved the best were nowhere to be found. They had taken root. They had sprung up into glory and a riot of color. But they had soon withered because life here was too shallow to sustain the flowers that he loved the best. So the legend says that the master cleft the prairies with a thunderbolt. The thunderbolt gouged out valleys and it carved deep canyons then again the master called for the birds and he sent the wind to spread the flowers the seeds of the flowers that he loved the best and again in the prairies the flowers soon withered and died but in the dark shadows of the valley and in the deep chasm of the canyons even today the prettiest flowers grow in the valleys and in the canyons those once ugly wounds when she heard the story her spirit softened her heart melted and her eyes flowed with the fountain of repentance and that day the master came and sowed in the deep canyon of her wounds and pains the seeds of the flowers that he loved the best when Jehu met Jonadab he asked a question that I believe that the Lord has sent me to Alexandria to ask this congregation is your heart right is my heart is right I'm not here I'm not interested right now about revival I don't want to talk to you about 
your ministry. I, 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 I don't want to discuss how your church is doing. My focus is not on your kids. But the Spirit wants to know, is your heart right? As my heart is right. You see, the heart is a silvery pond in which the golden fish and silver swim in slimy green things. It's an undiscovered country where men and women are forever perishing in its wilds. It's a raging ford where day and night the smith works to forge. It is a meadow of shimmering fireflies and fragrant flowers. But once again, it's a city of teeming with myriads of people. The heart is a garden, perhaps full of blossoms of hope. Perhaps for you, it's weeds of bitter memories. To be sure, the heart is one chamber where more blood-spattered tragedies has occurred than any other place. I've observed in the human heart, I've seen it as the throne of God, but I've also observed it as the council chamber of devils. Bend close with me now as I close. I want you to smell with me the human heart. Perhaps you will smell the sweet fragrance of forgiveness. Or perhaps you will respond and react to the acrid stench of bitterness. The oracle of Hebrews said, looking diligently lest any man should fail in the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled you see there were three lost parables in the New Testament the lost coin the lost sheep and the lost son the lost boy the shepherd went and looked for the sheep because they were lost in the hills. The woman looked, went and looked and swept and cleaned to find the coin because it was lost in the house. Nobody went looking for the boy because he was lost on the inside of himself. The tragedy is that we can weep over the men who won't sign the affirmation statement. We can pray for somehow the reconciliation for men who have fallen into moral failure. They're far more redeemable and, cover, and recoverable than some of us. Because in some of us, the brewing brew of bitterness. Lost inside of ourselves, you walked into this building you saw somebody and something rose up in you. You changed directions and you went another way so you didn't have to see them or speak to them. You've done it conference after conference. There are preachers right now sitting in this building that are taking their churches down long slides toward the world. And you say you couch it all in liberty. You couch it all in freedom from bondage. But all it is is there's a wound from some long past hurt that's burning in your spirit that like a cancer is eating your heart out. Hallelujah. Within this organization, there are bigotries and biases and prejudice against other men of like precious faith. I pray we go to Calvary tonight and we get it all out of our spirit. We get it all out of our heart. I'm closing past a line in time called the beginning before there was an angel before a heavenly before all realms there was no day nor night nor time nor creation in fact it was before everything except God and the wound lying in a pool of blood cold lifeless mangled form of a snow-white lamb slain 
wounded from the foundation of the world. Against the backdrop of heaven, draped with darkness, a grim, grotesque, ugly hill of the skull, modesty, holiness, purity, shamed by utter nakedness, beaten sadistically, wounded inhumanely, blood and water flowing from the wounded lamb. The lamb at the end looks back through the door in the timeline called the beginning and looked at the mangled form of the lamb before the foundation of the world. And the lamb who was at the beginning now hangs on his cross at the end and he looks back and he responds to a millennium's old wound and says, Father, forgive him. Somebody needs to get up and go to somebody right now. I don't care how embarrassed I was. I wouldn't go to hell. I wouldn't lose my ministry. I wouldn't lose my soul over bitterness. I'd go fall on somebody's neck right now. And I'd beg their forgiveness. If they're not here, I'd fall on my knees. And I'd say, oh, lamb. Oh, lamb. Forgive them. They had no way of knowing what they were doing. They had no way of knowing how deep the hurt. Father, forgive them. Don't sit here tonight. Don't let this service go any further. We are kidding ourselves. Hear me in the Holy Ghost. There are matters that must be resolved right now. There are things in the Spirit that must be addressed right now. Because if you don't do it right now, someday we will stand over your fallen form and grieve over such an inconsequential thing that brought you down because something ate your soul out of it. Come on, preachers. Come on, ministry. We have to answer to what we really know honestly in our hearts is a thing that afflicts us as a fellowship. Peter could walk on the water. Just don't ask him to get along with John. Miracles are a lot easier to perform than being in unanimity and harmony and spiritual oneness with your brother. Father, right now, in the Holy Ghost, you have a spiritual ministry for this congregation of men and women. I bind the spirits of pride. I take dominion and authority over spirits, long latent, malignant cancers of bitterness that brew in the hearts of men tonight. Let husbands and wives be reconciled. Let children and parents be reconciled in the Holy Ghost right now. Let neighboring pastors who cannot speak, who cannot even shake hands with one another, let them go to one another right now in the Holy Ghost. Let them fall on one another's necks in a spirit of forgiveness. Heal us. You were wounded for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon you. And with your stripes, we are healed.